Marining a gamela rhyme, winning a lana, garing a ganong in die wunder, so ban mal and die. Hello everybody, I'm Lingophiliax, and welcome to Minority Language Report. Today we're going to be looking at the language Gamilarai. 3, 2, 1, go! Gamilarai is an Australian language belonging to the Wiradjuric branch of the Vamanungan language family, along with Nyimba and, of course, Wiradjuri. It is traditionally spoken by the Gamilarai people in the Gamilarai Nation, located in the Riverine region and the central northeastern area of the state of New South Wales. While in English the term Gamilarai refers to the entire language, only the people who speak the dialect where the word Gamil means no would actually call themselves Gamilarai people. Some people may also refer to themselves as Yuwalarai, Yuwaliyai, Gwyn, Barai, Gaonbarai, Wittiarai, or Walarai people, as well as by various other names. As of 2007, the language was classified as recently extinct, but it is currently in the process of a revival. And there was much rejoicing. Ethnologue currently classifies the language as endangered, and according to a 2016 census, 105 people claim to speak Gamilarai at home. Phonetics. Gamilarai has three vowels with short and long forms of each, two phonemic diphthongs A and I, five places of articulation, each with an obstruent and a nasal consonant, two different rhotic consonants, a glide and a trill, two semi-vowels, and one lateral consonant. Most Bamanungan languages have a lateral consonant for all places of articulation that would anatomically allow it, however, Gamilarai only has the standard alveolar lateral approximant, which is kind of boring, IMHO, but it does make words a lot easier to pronounce correctly. Gamilarai does not phonemically allow consonant clusters, however certain unstressed vowels may be elided, giving the impression of consonant clusters. Stress typically falls on the first syllable of a word, however the long vowels are usually stressed as well, which may lead to stress falling on the second syllable should the first vowel be a short one. Gamilarai has a very CV or CVC syllable structure, and the phonotactics of Gamilarai are more or less as follows. Words may begin with most obstruents and nasals, aside from the plain alveolars, and very rarely the palatals, as well as the semi-vowels. Words may not begin with vowels, rotex, or the lateral approximant. Words may only end with vowels, the alveolar nasal, the trilled rhotic, the lateral approximant, and the palatal semivowel. Medial coders, which do not include vowels obviously, also follow this pattern, except the bilabial and velar nasals are permitted, and the palatal semivowel is not. Any of the six vowel phonemes may make up a syllable nucleus, as well as the diphthongs A and I. For example, in the words geat and geingol, the diphthongs are realised as the nucleus, whereas the consonants following them are realised as coders. And finally, any consonant may be used for any medial onset. Writing system. Gamilarai is written with the standard Latin alphabet, using a, I, and U for the vowels R, E, and U, doubling them to signify long vowels, and using voiced letters to transcribe the obstruents, that is, using B for B, D for D, and G for G, the last of which I'll come back to in a second. The glide rhotic R is written with a single R, the trilled rhotic R is written with a double R, dentals D and N are written with alveolar letters followed by an H, and the palatals are written D, J for the obstruent J, and N, Y for the nasal N. This split transcription for palatal consonants is not uncommon in Australian languages, and along with the double vowels and voiced obstruents, it gives the written language its own distinct look. Gamilarai also transcribes the velar nasal N with NG, two letters which on their own transcribe N and G respectfully. This wouldn't be a problem if UNG wasn't phonemically distinct from UNG, but it is. Gamilarai works around this problem by separating N and G with a full stop to signify that each letter is pronounced separately. I'm just going to say that from a computing standpoint this doesn't seem like the best option they could have gone with, but either way it's still an effective bodge. Grammar. Gamilarai is an agglutinative and highly suffixing language with a fluid word order, although the most common word order appears to be SOV. Verbs are conjugated according to tense and aspect, and there are four different conjugation paradigms. Most verbs ending in li and ri are transitive verbs, most ending in ye are intransitive, and verbs ending in ge could be either one, we have no idea. Come on, just make your mind up ge verbs. There are two simple tenses, the past and the future, the latter of which is also the dictionary form of verbs, and there is also a simple imperative mood for giving commands. There are also two progressive aspects, the regular progressive and the moving progressive. Both progressive aspects are also conjugated for past and future tense, as well as the imperative, and a unique present tense suffix na that only appears on progressives. And that's pretty much all the basic information you need to know about conjugating verbs, but it is far from the full picture. There are also reflexives, reciprocals, benefactives, causatives, relative clause suffixes, suffixes for the time of day. I did mention this language was agglutinative, right? The point being, I think that's enough information on verbs relevant to this report, so let's talk about nouns. Gamilaray nouns are declined according to seven cases, however there are only four or five different forms of each word. There are three core cases for morphosyntactic alignment, the nominative, marking an transitive subject, the ergative marking a transitive subject, and the accusative marking a transitive object. Then there are the three local cases for spatial location, the ablative for movement towards something, the locative for being on, at, or inside something, and the ablative for movement away from something. And then there's the dative case, which doesn't fit into either category and has a couple of functions including possession, purpose, and benefactive. Basically it encompasses the meaning of the English prepositions of, to, or for, depending on the context. It becomes even more context-dependent, however, if the word 
word in question has the same form for the dative, the ergative, and the allative case. In fact, there's quite a lot of overlap between those three cases. I wouldn't be surprised if they were all considered the same thing at one point in history. And on top of that, the ergative case also functions as an instrumental, which does kind of make sense when you think about it, since both the subject and the instrument used by the subject cause the action to occur. But the point being is that since a word ending in gu could be the subject, the indirect object, the instrument, the benefactor, the possessor, the goal, and the destination all rolled into one, you might as well call this a postpositional suffix. Jeez, even Poobah would say that's kind of overdoing it. This Lord of the Treasury, Lord Chief Justice Commander in Chief Master of the Buckhounds, Lord High Admiral Groom of the Backstairs, Archbishop of Titty Poo, and Lord Mayor, both acting and elect. Okay, that might be a slight exaggeration. Like most Bamanyungan languages, Gamilaray is regarded as an ergative absolutive language where only the subject of transitive clauses is inflected, but the subject of intransitive clauses and the object of transitive clauses is not inflected. However, this is only true for nouns and third person pronouns in Gamilaray. The first and second person pronouns, on the other hand, are marked in a nominative accusative alignment, where the accusative form is marked, but the nominative and ergative are not. I don't know, I just thought that was interesting. Gamilaray has singular, dual, and plural numbers for all personal pronouns, although technically the third person pronoun uses a unique dual suffix gala. Interestingly, the dual suffix is also marked in the accusative, meaning that the third person dual pronoun is probably the only word in the language that has a unique form for the nominative, ergative, and accusative. While there are a couple of nominal suffixes for number and gender, they are regarded as optional attributes rather than strict rules, and the number or gender of a noun in question is either inferred from context or is an indivisible semantic component of the word in question. There are two other notable suffixes in Gamilaray shared by a lot of Australian languages that I feel deserve to be mentioned, the having suffix and the lacking suffix. These suffixes create new words by drawing focus on the qualities it either has or does not have respectfully. In fact, the having suffix occurs in the word gamilarai, specifying that this dialect of the language has the word gamil for no. Other dialects, such as the one mentioned at the start of this video, are also named in a similar fashion with their individual words for no, plus their own version of the having suffix. Numbers. Even though originally, like a lot of Australian languages, people could only linguistically count up to five and anything above that was considered many or a lot, modern gamilarai uses a decimal system. As much as I would love to go into the history of this and ramble on about how gamilarai developed new words for numbers that didn't previously exist in the language, I think I'll have to save that for another time. There are also words for 10, 100, 000, and million, and the numbers higher than 20 are expressed with the multiplying number first, followed by the place value. So for example, the number 213 would be expressed as 2 times 100 plus 10 plus 3. Bularba biga banai goliba. Kinship. Because the Gamilaray language is part of an Australian nation, it should come as no surprise that the Gamilaray people have an Australian kinship system, including moieties, totems, and of course, skin names, or as I like to call them, incest repellent. Gamilaray has four skin names, or sections. Mari and Gabi belong to the moiety Wudoru, and Gambu and Ibai belong to Yanguru. There are also female forms of each name, Mada, Buda, Gabuda, and Ibada. Unfortunately, due to colonialist history, we don't exactly know everything about which totem belonged to which moiety prior to invasion. Literally, all I could find was that the Wallaby, Duck, Goanna, Kookaburra, Possum, Red Snake, Carpet Snake, and Kangaroo belong to the Wudoru moiety, and the Gala, Emu, Frog, and a different kangaroo belong to the Yanguru moiety. I'm guessing a distinction was made between Red Kangaroo and Grey Kangaroo like other kinship systems, but I don't have any confirmation of this, and even if I did, I don't know which one belongs to which moiety anyway. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with Australian kinship systems might be thinking, what the hell does this have to do with language? Well, the first thing a person does when they meet a stranger for the first time is discuss their kinship and the relationship they have to each other. This determines several things, like whether they were related, whether they could get married or not, whether they should be speaking to each other at all. It also determines what terms people should address each other by. You could address someone by their personal name, skin name, family totem, clan totem, or the kinship relation you share with them. As a random example, let's imagine a man whose skin name is Gabi meets a woman whose skin name is Buddha. The closest Buddha woman related to a Gabi man would be his father's sister, or aunt, and his daughter. Thus he would probably address the woman with these same terms, depending on whichever feels most appropriate between them. Conversely, the woman may refer to him as her father, or her brother's son or nephew. As a result of the cyclical nature of skin names, the familial terms follow an Iroquois kinship system when mapped out on a family tree. Although, as far as I'm aware, nowadays this kinship system is largely defunct, having been replaced with surnames, which is a real shame because, in my 
my humble opinion, it's cool as hell and everyone should be using it. And now that this report is starting to get a little opinionated, I think it's time to wrap up by saying, if you're interested in learning more about the language, the main source I definitely recommend is the Gayeriki Winningerly application that is entirely free to download, containing hundreds of Gamilarai, Yuwalarai, and Yuwaliai words, hundreds of example sentences, and a few songs, stories, and memory games to help with learning and building vocabulary. I'd also recommend a grammar of Yuwalarai and Gamilarai by John Jackin, which goes into a whole lot more detail and covers things I couldn't go over in this video. Just Google search Gamilarai grammar and the PDF should show up in the results. Other sources include Yuwalarai.org and the Speak Gamilarai YouTube channel, which have songs and stories for people to learn and memorize, and of course there are loads of Gamilarai people on social media and I'm sure some of them would be okay with teaching you some language if you just ask them. And before I go, I just wanted to say, if you're a Gamilarai person watching this video, always remember that communication is crucial to the survival of any language, and any knowledge you have about the language and culture, like literally anything, no matter how big or small, is valuable. Do not let anybody tell you otherwise. Anyway, speaking of communication, don't forget to give this video a big thumbs up, share it with your friends, and subscribe for more content like this. If there's anything in this video I got wrong, you can let me know in the comments, and don't forget to follow me on social media. Thank you all for listening, and we'll speak again next time.